Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. Welcome to the podcast, Head to Toe, as we move around the body. My name is Daisy Cunningham. I am the college's heritage manager. And I'm Olivia Howitt, and I'm a volunteer with the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh Heritage. And today we've made it as far as the bladder. And I think today is going to be pretty urine heavy. Yes. I'm not sure how much I found that isn't urine while researching for this. Well, I was looking into bladder stones. I mean, they're sort of urine related. Supposedly, a lot of figures in history had them. King Leopold I of Belgium, Peter the Great, Louis the Fourteenth, George the Fourth, Oliver Cromwell, Benjamin Franklin, Newton, um, but also Bonaparte. And we know that because his personal doctor at the time did um, an autopsy after he died. And he noted that Napoleon's bladder was shrunken, filled with stone debris and thickened with mucosa and erythematous patches, which was probably due to urethral stricture. That paints a beautiful picture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Urethral stricture, great pop band name. (laughs) But no, and, and it definitely seems like something which was, as you say, not entirely uncommon, but also pretty terrifying for a lot of people to get it treated. So lithotomy, which was, you know, the the process of sort of removing the stones, it sounded like a pretty unpleasant process. So they were desperately trying to find something that a physician could give you rather than going for the surgical option. Someone who knows more than either of us would be able to explain why it seems like it was so much more common in, in, you know, the sort of 1600s, 1700s than it seems to be today. Apparently, Napoleon said that his bladder was his weak spot and it is by this that I shall die. It's not necessarily prescient. It's just, as you say, a representation of just how much pain he was in. Mm. We have, it is a copy, but it's a contemporary copy as in literally made at the time on St Helena copy of his uh, post-mortem because of the context in which it was written and who it was written about i.e. Napoleon it feels like it's not purely scientific it is almost cruel some of the descriptions in the post-mortem you know the way that they describe how fat he was and the fat around his organs feels like it is sort of somewhat derogatory rather than purely a kind of scientific description <laughs> So on to our topic of urine. You know, unsurprisingly, so often um, when we're talking about the history of medicine, things come back to humoral theory and the balance of the four humours. And urine is a part of that, unsurprisingly, because it is another thing in the body which can be removed to rebalance, but also that can then be examined to determine somebody's humoral balance. So diuresis is, is a form of treatment which is pretty common, you know, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, for a huge range of diseases which removing urine or, or reducing the quantity of urine you wouldn't think would necessarily be helped by it. And the, the specific items that are used as diuretics are very local, very regionally specific. They're whatever you could easily get your hands on. So in Scotland, you know, leeks, watercress, strawberries, barley water is a common one. And that then became a sort of popular drink. But also, as I say, you know, urine is also important because once it is removed, you can study it and it can tell you, in theory, all sorts of things about your patient. Again, very much disclaimer of, you know, we're talking about historic ideas rather than what's actually the case. So uroscopy is incredibly popular. The analysis of urine, the colour of urine, the smell of urine, and I'm sorry to say, the taste of urine. That's the interesting bit. It is the bit, it's the bit which makes go oh no oh no 
So you can tell somebody's humoral balance in theory by analysing these sorts of qualities. There's lots of old illustrations from kind of 1500s, 1600s sort of time of doctors holding up jars and sniffing jars to kind of analyse it. We have a late 1400s manuscript in the college called Judicium Uranium, which is exactly what it says on the tin. It has lots of illustrations of different colours of urine and it's in theory a guide to whoever's reading it as to you know what what you think from looking at the urine. And there is obviously urine that is standard urine coloured. There's also green urine, red urine, black urine. But and and of all the various things that you supposedly could tell. So in theory, you could tell if somebody was melancholy or hysterical or all sorts of things. The only one that we know did actually work was tasting urine to check for diabetes. So if a urine is sweet or sweeter, that works as an indication of diabetes. As an English physician, Thomas Willis, who was writing in the 1600s, who said, it was wonderfully sweet as if imbued with honey or sugar. How do you feel about the word wonderfully? Makes it sound like he's tasting wine or something. Mm. But like I say, you know, in, in, a, in a time when there are so few useful indicators, the fact that this works however unpleasant it may be, probably does make it worthwhile. There's a, a cartoon or, or an illustration by William Hogarth from the 1700s called The Company of Undertakers. Essentially, it's a group of people, one of whom is holding a urine flask, and the rest are either smelling it or they're holding canes to their noses. Physicians' canes would have often had herbs or nice-smelling things in them, the idea being if you're dealing with horrible smells, you would sort of sniff your cane to cleanse your palate. And half of them are quacks, and they are specific quacks. They're individual people who are kind of known, and half of them are physicians. As I understand it, it's showing that when you're doing things like smelling or tasting urine, there's really no difference between what a physician does and what a quack does. It's all sort of the same, I think, is the kind of message of it. <laughs> there's quite a lot of um, paintings as well that it's a physician practicing uroscopy, inspecting like flasks of urine. One thing I found out, because it's quite a common theme in Flemish and Dutch art, <laughs> the Dutch word for someone who looks at urine, I'm going to have to be careful with how I say it, is pischkeiger. Which Good word is variably translated to urine examiner, pee looker, or what it sounds like also, his <laughs> <Piss-gazer. laughs> I like that, because I think it is also from the Dutch, the word quack. I think it's quack salve. And I, and I suppose, yeah, the sort of analysis of urine, it falls into the same category as a lot of other quack processes in that they start off in the kind of earlier days of medicine being associated with physicians. And then physicians start to develop more laboratory, scientific, research-based techniques. And I guess that's, you know, when, when William Hogarth was doing his illustration in the 1700s, that's probably exactly that time where it's that sort of transition where physicians are shifting and the quacks are either acquiring or staying with these sort of more uncomplicated techniques. I did read that apart from the the more medical examination of urine, there was also something called uromancy, which is divination from looking at urine. In ancient Rome, it was done by examining the bubbles in the chamber pot after uh, someone had peed. And if there were large bubbles that were a fair distance apart, that would be an indication of good fortune, potentially money coming your way. But if there were no bubbles or very small bubbles close together, that was a bad omen. And that was like death, loss, illness. I thought that was quite funny. I I, I assume that you have to do this quite quickly if you're doing it as a bubble-based thing. You'd have to... (laughs) urinate and then literally like instantly because if a company looks at it an hour later it's going to be completely different isn't it while you mention analyzing the contents of chamber pots i was going to say i got quite excited by chamber pots i've got to be careful in some of these themed episodes (laughs) that i don't make it sound weird but looking into the history of chamber pots obviously this is a vast history people have written many many books on it and so we're only going to touch it in the most superficial of ways but i learned a few things that i didn't know i didn't realize how sort of ubiquitous chamber pots were in many rooms of the house i think i'd assumed that they were primarily in the bedroom probably under the bed but uh, various descriptions talk about them being in drawing rooms and dining rooms just behind a screen 
So you wouldn't see the person, but they would be there. This was not really the case in Victorian, possibly not even in Georgian, but in earlier periods, it was not uncommon to have a chamber pot behind a screen in the room that you were drinking in or dining in. Again, gender comes into it quite a lot. So there's quite a few sort of descriptions of women just trying to drink as little as possible so that if they are out at a ball, at a dance, they just won't need to go to the bathroom because it is so complicated for women with the kind of clothes they're wearing. Again, we're thinking sort of particularly wealthy women here. So supposedly the first flushing toilets were not developed in Britain until the 19th century. But I've read a fact that said flush toilets were commonly found in urban areas of the Indus Valley civilization about 2000 BCE. So their version of flush might be you know, sluicing with water. It's definitely tricky though. The concept of the flush toilet existed. There were some of them. But the problem was you couldn't really roll them out in any dramatic way until you had some kind of sewerage system or some sort of effective disposal system. Because if everyone had a flush toilet but there was no disposal system, it doesn't really work. So I think, as you say, the kind of mid-1800s is when it's considered to have them as standard or, or to roll them out in a more general way because it's just feasible because they have the sort of disposal systems. But in earlier times, they definitely had flushing water closets or, or toilets. But then it would just be going into essentially a chamber pot or down some sort of funnel system. Someone then had to come and shovel it and take take it away and deal with it. So it's not flushing in the sense that we would understand it. There was a role called a necessary. You were called a necessary or a necessary servant because you were dealing with the necessaries. I've never waste. heard of that before. That's brilliant. The other job title is night soil servant or night soilman, which is when the, the, the sort of waste was flushed outside of the building. So it wasn't just sort of collecting in a sort of bucket or, or chamber pot. So it's kind of cesspits of waste waste and they would come round with their carts and pick it up or pick some of it up anyway and kind of take it away. So there's a lot of jobs involved pre-sewerage pipes. <laughs> some interesting things about incontinence. So there was a book called Chirurgie by an 18th century physician called German Lorenz Heister and he dedicated two chapters to male and female incontinence and in his opinion bladder stones or paralysis of the bladder sphincter were the two reasons for incontinence in men. He suggested this device which was um, a glass or pig bladder urinal that you attach to the waist with a belt also <laughs> suggested a different device which was more of a clamp attached to a belt which provided perineal compression to stop people peeing i don't really like either of them but i think i'd go for the first one if i had mm. to <laughs> in our case study today we're going to look at the humble chamber pot an absolute necessity in the pre-flushing toilet era, a chamber pot is essentially a portable toilet. Once toilets became the norm even, while they remained for most outside the house, and therefore requiring a trip outdoors in the dead of night, chamber pots continued to be used by many until each home having its own indoor toilet became standard. Chamber being an old term for bedroom, chamber pot therefore is the bedroom toilet. Although chamber pots were often found in other rooms in the house as well, sometimes the kitchen, or even the dining room. Sometimes chamber pots were hidden inside modified chairs, known as clothes stools, or in a nightstand, known as a commode. If you didn't have one of these more refined methods of storage, you probably kept your chamber pot under your bed. Chamber pots came in a variety of different styles. Some looked much like a chair or stool with a hinge lid, Others look like a pot or dish, sometimes with a removable lid. But of those styles varied, the function was always the same. Through the years, chamber pots have been made of almost every type of material that would hold liquid. The chamber pots of the wealthy European royal families, aristocracy and upper class, were made of pewter, copper, silver and sometimes even gold. Victorian chamber pots were often decorated with landscapes or flowers. The contents would be disposed of in the morning, sometimes onto a cesspool or an outdoor toilet, sometimes by dumping it directly onto the street or out of a window. 
This was a particular issue in Edinburgh's old town, where tenements were up to 14 storeys high, and so the journey down to street level to safely dispose of the contents was just too far for many. Pots were filled and then simply emptied out of a window, pouring down onto the streets below. In 1749, the so-called Nastiness Act was passed, which decreed that waste could only be tossed out of windows between 10pm and 7am. The person throwing the waste was to call out Gardy Lou, a corruption of a French phrase meaning watch the water, to warn those passing below. In this short clip, Dr Jennifer Evans, senior lecturer at the University of Hertfordshire, talks about urinary complaints and their connection with masculinity. Patricia Simons has explained that the way men controlled and expelled urine from the body was important to constructions of masculinity. Urination offered humorous, public and assertive ways to present manliness to others. Standing upright during urination reflected male dominance and social position over women who had to squat down low to the floor in order to pass water. In the humoral medical model which dominated early modern thought, women were presented as cold and leaky vessels in contrast to warmer, drier men. Incontinence thus made men's bodies appear more feminine and demonstrated an inability to exert control over their physical self. As they'd done in other areas though, medical writers presented these concerns to readers, but downplayed the potential for lasting consequences to hinder patients' lives and to change the outward appearance of their masculine body. They highlighted in particular the use of assistive technologies like pipes to overcome these problems. Ambrose Paré included a chapter in his surgical treatise describing methods to relieve men who, quote, have their urine flow from them against their wills and such as want their yards. In this, he directly compared men who could not urinate standing up to women and thereby emasculated them. He said, those that have their yards cut off too close to their bellies are greatly troubled in the making of urine, so that they're constrained to sit down like women for their ease. To compensate for such problems, Paré explained that he had devised a pipe or conduit, having a hole through it as big as one's finger, which may be made of wood. In cases of other urinary conditions that resulted in, in incontinence, Paré was similarly clear that these difficulties could be overcome, allowing men to live their lives unimpeded. For example, when discussing strangury, the painful shedding of urine by drops, he explained that it meant that men leaped urine against their will, which was particularly problematic for those who needed to travel. In order to help um, assuage this, he created a device that would contain and catch strips and allow men to carry on um, travelling as they needed to. Lithotomy, the surgery um, to treat bladder and kidney stones, was also considered to be very dangerous to the body's ability to retain urine. Felix Platter's medical text recorded that sometimes the urine flows another way out, out of the wound in the cutting for the stone, where it flows from the perineum, till it be healed. The same may be about the loins or the lower parts of the belly from a wound there, as we knew one who made no, no urine but at his groin for many years. Francois Tollet believed that men who were left with leaking fistulas were to be pitied um, and that those who became incontinent were to be, quote, ranked amongst the miserable. However, Felix Platter again implied that lasting leakage would not be problematic. He recited the story of a fisherman whose bladder from a rupture in the groin fell into the cods and lay stretched out and voided no urine, but by a catheter, while an ignorant surgeon let it out by the cutting thereof, which gave ease to the patient with great danger, from which being freed, he pisses yet through a fistula that remains by drawing forth a tent wherewith it stopped. The suggestion that this man simply plugged up his fistula with a cloth and removed it in order to urinate was presented as unproblematic and an acceptable outcome, which perhaps it was if the other options were more severe or death. Um, but Richard Wiseman was similar um, in suggesting that the inability to hold urine would not necessarily be a problem. He recorded the case of a 50-year-old man who suffered a suppression of urine um, caused by gonorrhea and a gangrene of the right testicle. Wiseman explained that the urine passed through the gangrene afflicted area and noted that at the end of treatment his urine passed somewhat by the natural way and at last it passed better and that the man had since been married to a young woman. Again he suggested that leaking urine had not disrupted the man's ability to create a household or potentially sexually satisfy his wife. 
but apparently incontinence was not viewed the same by all patients. Wiseman noted in another case where the patient was left in a similar condition that he often complained of his unhappy condition. Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today. So it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine, or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. Historic recipes for bladder-related complaints seem to have a particularly large number of obscure or archaic items in them. So this seems like a good opportunity to do a bit of a breakdown of what some of these terms mean. And I apologise in advance for how much I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of some of these. So these include sesaminium oil, decoction of acquisitum, water of hedra teratesis, pilicella, decoction of acrosis, the roots of meum, the roots of elecampane, the roots of anonis, carby, gromel, betony, ruscus, imperatoria, smyrnium, and dens leonis. I'm not sure I said any of those correctly. And I'm almost grateful when I get an entry for difficulty in making urine, which recommends, quote, a fox blood, hot anointed upon the privy members. Sesamian oil, by the way, is just sesame oil. Aquisitum is a type of fern which was used as a diuretic, so to produce urine. Hedra terrestris is also known as ground ivy and was another diuretic. Pilocella was also known as mouse ear hawkweed and was one of those supposed cure-alls, good for influenza consumption, whooping cough, and many, many more diseases. A chorus is a flowering plant and seems to have been used by quite a few people as a muscle relaxant. Elecampan is also known as elf dock, and particularly associated in folklore with elves and with magical healing of almost all diseases and miraculous recoveries from poisoning. Gromwell is also known as Gromwell, or European stone seed. Betony is a common hedge nettle. This was used as a treatment, and according to the English herbalist John Gerard, it, quote, maketh a man to piss well. But it was also a protector from witchcraft, and it was recommended that you hang it in your house to ward off evil spirits. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, click like, or leave a positive review or comment. We really appreciate it because it helps us get higher in the rankings and reach more people. Thank you.